A Writer at Work. CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, an inquiry into the way a writer works. This is Jan Minor. I'm an actress. My work is to speak the lines written by writers, to give expression to their thoughts to live for the moment the parts they create. Yet I don't know any more than most people do about the way a writer has furnished me with what I say. And as many of you may have wondered, I've asked myself, how does a writer work? Where and how does he get his ideas? What is the so-called creative process? Is it entirely by inspiration? Or can creativity be induced? All this is what the workshop investigates tonight. And writer Hector Chevigny has been asked to be the subject. Well, he should be able to satisfy our curiosity, having been a professional writer for 28 years. During his long and successful career, Mr. Chevigny has published five books, won a literary prize winner, and some 30 short stories and articles. He has also written for motion pictures and for radio and television, has written more than a thousand plays. What the workshop will do tonight will be to show this writer actually at work through tape recording. Then the finished script, the result of his work, will be produced. Here is Mr. Chevigny in a brief preliminary interview. Uh, I'm willing to take part in this thing tonight, providing no one concludes that I believe that I'm a typical writer. There are no typical writers. Writers are highly individualistic and tend to vary sharply in temperament and character. But there's one thing that they all do, and that is work and work hard, the successful ones, that is. They don't sit around waiting for the inspiration. They induce it by working. Oh, their methods of working vary. Some prefer a typewriter. Some prefer a pencil. Some dictate. Some can't stand to have anyone around them. I know one man who thinks he can write well only on blue paper. But all the writers that I know follow the maxim of the late, great uh, Haywood Broon. As Mr. Broon said, success in writing is achieved by the application of the seat of the pants to the seat of the chair. (laughs) Mr. Chevigny does appear to follow the Haywood Broon maxim. He works seven days a week, month in and out. His weekday work schedule calls for seven hours a day. And on Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays, he puts in three to four hours. And this is at his desk in his workroom. Now, perhaps this tough grind is for the reason that Mr. Chevney's assignment these four years has been the CBS daytime serial, The Second Mrs. Burton. It calls for five scripts a week. Now, is it because of The Burton Show that you, uh, Hector, work this way? Not entirely. I've been following that work schedule for the last 17 years or since I became a self-employed writer. Mm Mm-hmm. Why, Hector? You see, there's such a fixed notion in people's minds that a writer's work has to be um, spasmodic, that he has to wait for the inspiration. And it comes as sort of a shock to hear that a writer is a drudge. Well, Jan, a famous woman novelist that I used to know quite well once said to me, I have to put in a certain number of hours every day without fail. It has often struck me that my mind is a little like the muscles of a pianist, who, if he stays away from his keyboard even for one day, finds it doubly difficult to return to it. Other writers have told me the same thing. Regularity is the essential. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, the so-called creative process seems to, to leave you. That's right. It seems to quit on you. Hence the need for the long daily application. That's right. Uh-huh. Well, I'll be fascinated on hearing the recording made of you working, Hector. And the script on which Mr. Shevney worked as he was recorded was for the second Mrs. Burton. Now, that is a story about a family, the Burton family. And they're supposed to live in a town up the Hudson Valley. And the dominant figure is wealthy Mother Burton, who insists on running the lives of her son and daughter and everyone else around her. Her daughter is Marcia, who's married to Lou Archer. And her son is Stan, who's married to Terry. 
which part I have the daily satisfaction of playing. So that everyone will have an impression of the characters, here's a brief scene from Burton Life, as it might be if the family were having after-dinner coffee at, uh, say, Mother's house. <laughs> Marsh, I did not say a writer cannot be a gentleman. Well, then what did you say? Sounded to me like that's what you said, Mother. How's about a shade more coffee, please? Hand me your cup. Now, what I said was it's difficult to see how writers can be gentlemen. Uh, what they do for a living makes them entirely too inquisitive. Well, Lou's a gentleman, and he used to write me poetry. Didn't you, darling? Uh, yes, Angel, but uh, what do you say we don't go into that now? Well, huh? it seems to me that some writer could make a fortune putting this family into a book or one of those serials. Oh, Terry, please. Oh, but how could a story about us get published or go on the air? I wouldn't want to be the writer who tried it. After a while, he'd have to have shock treatments. And uh, would anybody believe it? Oh, really, Terry, <laughs> at times your remarks are so unsettling. Put us into a book or a serial, indeed. No matter what... What writer tried it, I assure you that he would be no gentleman. Now we're going to put on the recording of Mr. Chevigny in his workroom, which is the word he himself uses for what was formerly called the library in the rambling, high-ceilinged old apartment on Manhattan's Gramercy Park, where Chevigny also lives with his family. He happens to work with a secretary, so his work process is audible, which is another reason he was the writer asked to be the subject of this investigation. Every morning, Mrs. Eleanor Lone comes to function as secretary, and this is the way things went near the start of the day at about half past nine a.m. Music, Burton theme down four. Announcer. In Dixon, New York, today is Thanksgiving Day, period. As usual, Mother insisted the family dine with her, period. Mm -hmm. So they came, Marcia and her family, Stan and his, and here they are around the great oak table under the uh, Victorian chandelier in the dining hall at Burton Towers. Sound effects, tableware as wanted. Mother, she says. Mm -hmm. And are you ready for more turkey, Terry dear? Mm -hmm. Terry. Not quite yet, Mother, but... No. Oh, uh, well, see what it is. Mr. Chevigny's office. I'm fine, thank you, Mr. Davis. And you? Our dear director, huh? Good. Yes, he is here. Hold on, please. Stan Davis for you. Well, don't be so cheery with him. He's only the director. <laughs> Hi, Stan. Yep, yep, yep. I wrote her in that day, and I wrote her in the following day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep, I just... Well, I looked it up, you know. You know, what she got, a television show? We interfered with the rehearsal. Of the, mm -hmm. Oh, dear. I feel like asking some of these people what, what television's got that our show hasn't got unless it's fame and money. <laughs> mm. Hey, Stan, have you got an idea for a Thanksgiving script? <laughs> Of course I'm up there. I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to catch up so that we can. I'm not blowing up. I'm just telling you that I'm that I'm up there and that I didn't discover until this morning that that's where I am and I haven't got an idea. Mm-hmm. What? <laughs> hey, Eleanor. Uh, mm -hmm. He wants to know if we can do a human sacrifice. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, you're going to tape the show. Yeah, all right. Yeah, well, she's in both scripts. Okay, kid. Yeah, see ya. Can I hang this up? Yeah, sure. Oh, I was on that 
corny line of mothers. Do you yeah, want more turkey? Yeah, you know, are you ready for more turkey, Terry? You wild boys, yeah. CBS ready for more turkey if this script goes through. <laughs> Oh, brother, why do I have to do a dinner? Everybody does a dinner on every daytime cereal. Eleanor, what I'm going to do, I'm going to get back to the correspondence we laid aside there after all, and I, I will answer that letter to Paul Franklin to see if I can't get off this kick here and on well, something else there. If I can find it, this desk is well, such in, a mess. Yeah, yeah, well, it's in the box there, I think. It's about two hours later in Shevney's workroom, about 11.30. All right, we get going again there. Going to do the dinner thing after all, I guess. Good, good, good. Oh, cut it out, will you? Um, announcer, today in Dixon, New York, is Thanksgiving Day. Mother, well, I tell you, use the rest of the narration as I had it there the first time. The... Family going to have dinner at mother's house. Down to sound effects, tableware is wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, mother, aren't you ready for more of the turkey, Terry, dear? Terry. Not quite yet, no, mother. Mother. And you, Stan, aren't you ready? Oh, darn these holiday scripts, you... They always interrupt the plot, and they have to do something special. You didn't do anything special for July 4th. Like fun we didn't. We worked until 9 o'clock the night we wrote that script. Oh, that's right. How did I ever forget that? But doesn't everybody eat Thanksgiving dinner on Thanksgiving Day? They don't have to do it on my scripts. Oh, boy. I wish I wish you had reminded me of this a couple of days ago, kid. I thought you knew. Well, I didn't. Oh, tune in next week in the pitfall hour. <laughs> you know, I came to New York looking for pitfalls, and I haven't found a good pitfall in a couple of years. <laughs> hey, did I ever tell you that I used to work for IBM? No, did you? Yeah. I should have stayed with him, too. That's clear. Well, look, this is just wasting time. All right, let me try it again. Mm -hmm. Uh, Music Burton theme down for uh, announcer uh, Dixon, New York. Today's Thanksgiving Day, etc. Down to the sound effects music again, please. Mm -hmm. Mother. Mother. Yeah, going to start with mother. Uh... Yes, Marcia. In my opinion, you did speak of Thanksgiving Day flippantly. Marcia, flippantly! Exclamation point. Stan. I didn't hear her say anything flippant about Thanksgiving Day, Mother. Oh, cut it. You see, the. I don't have. You gotta have a beginning, a middle, and an end to a script. All I got is a big, great, big, fat middle. <laughs> Uh, well, look, it isn't funny. Uh, you know, I wish they had Roosevelt back in office. He put Thanksgiving Day off a week every year. <laughs> well, keep going. Let me see that flippantly thing there. Oh, yes, Stan, I didn't hear Marcia say anything flippant. Mother, Marcia, there, Mother, Stan didn't hear me say anything flippant. We got to bring the kids in here somehow. Mm-hmm. Sound. Dish suddenly overturned. Marcia. Oh, Ralphie! Exclamation point. Ralphie sets up howl. <laughs> hey, do I have a lunch date with somebody? Um, no. Music Burton theme down four. In Dixon, New York, today is Thanksgiving Day. We had that, didn't we? The time is now half past two. 
Read me from the top of page seven, mm -hmm. more, please. Lou, I didn't say that, Stan. I just said that I'm not a person who would prefer to have lived in the past. Brilliant. Marcia, what Lou is satisfied with is to live in the present day, but with the antiques of 300 years ago. Lou, I'm living with you, Angel. Are you 300 years old? Marcia, oh, you know what I mean. Terry, I feel the way Lou does. Mother, you do, Terry? Well, I must disagree. The graciousness of the past, the greater leisure and respect for the fine things of life. Stan, oh, Mother, how do you mm -hmm. really know what life was like 300 years ago? Mm -hmm. That's as far as you go. It's all just nothing but dialogue all the way through. You don't like the little joke about Marcia being an antique? No. Well, I like it all right, but... But I shouldn't try to sell it. Oh. Maybe I take these things too hard. But I like to have some kind of an idea, and I like to have it a little bright and cute. Just, that's all. Just, uh, that's all I ask, it's just to be bright and cute. Oh. Uh, I wonder how it'd be if we had a... I wonder how it'd be if we had a... Um, a dream sequence. I know it's done pretty often, but uh, Stan or Terry had to have a dream about 300 years ago, Thanksgiving Pilgrim Days, with a kind of a gag about, uh, you know, the Dean Thou language. Uh, well, that's not exactly going forward, is it? No, no, it isn't going forward, but uh, at least it's, it mounts it, as they say in television. <laughs> Maybe it's tough, sis. <laughs> uh, hey, let me try it. Let me try it. Let me try it. Well, let's start out. Uh, when I'll, um, um, Terry and Stan, um, still in bed. They're waked up by mother, telephone. She's been invited over to their house for a change. She's, mm -hmm. They're trying to get some sleep Thanksgiving morning, that sort of thing. It's said it. And then go into, um, go into the throwback to, well, well, let me try it. You got it? No, wait a minute. No, I'm not going to do this mother calling up. Hey, you ready? Burton theme down for... Aren't yeah. you ready? Well, just about. Now I am. All right. The Burton theme down for... Sound. <laughs> Alarm clock suddenly goes off. Oh. Oh. oh gone that clock. I can't find it. Oh, oh here. Oh, you found it. Good. Uh-huh. Oh, it's time to get up, I guess. Uh huh, for me, but you can sleep a while yet, but not too long. I want you to help me. What are you talking about? Oh, Stan, darling, this year we're having the whole family right here. We're having the whole family? Yes, this is Thanksgiving Day, remember? Oh, oh, yeah, well, yeah. Thanksgiving. Well, up and doing, Terry Burton. Yeah, and we've got to go to that pageant at Wendy's school, too, don't we? Mm hmm, of course we do. Pageant. The teacher staging that thing knows less about our pilgrim ancestors than I do. <laughs> she wouldn't know which way to point a blunderbuss. Oh, yeah. You say I can sleep a little longer? Until about 9.30, and then I need your help. All right. You wake me when you want me, will you? You just wake me when you want me. <sighs> Lord and Master, wake. Uh, oh, what? Oh, oh, Terry. Oh, time to get up, is it? Aye, that it is. Arise. Okay. No sooner said than done. Wait a minute. I am all dressed. And what kind of a get-up is this, anyway? And you, where'd you get the funny clothes? Oh, I do not comprehend thee, Lord and Master. Lord and Master? Hey, cut it out, will you? What's this, a gag? And look, what are all those old blunderbusses doing hanging on the walls? Where am I, anyway? Why, why thou art in the loft of thine own dwelling. In the loft of mine own dwelling? What ails thee? I don't know. I feel fine. Oh, stop jesting with me. I have much too much to do. For today thy dear mother cometh to dinner, and thy sister Marcia and her family, and of course thy son Brad is already here. Well, how come Brad's home? 
Then why should Mother and everybody be here for dinner? Oh, my husband, hast thou forgotten what day it is? Why, this is... Oh, Brad. My dear stepmother, why, Grandmother yes, Burton Brad. has arrived. Oh, thy grandmother? Oh, I must, I must go below. I was not there to greet her. Hurry thee, Stan. Hurry. Yes, yes, song. All right, Terry. Holy cow. What is it, Father? You're dressed the same way I am. Art thou surprised? You talk that way too, huh? I do not comprehend thee, Father. I don't dig thee either, I'll tell you that. Wait a minute, what year is this? The year? Huh. Why does the year 1656? 1656? A.D.? Oh, A.D. Uh-huh. Well, look, uh, how come you're, you're home from college? You uh, do go to college, don't you? Uh, I mean, you will. Uh, that is, you're supposed to. I attend Yale College, yes, indeed. And I'm home because this is Thanksgiving Day. Thanksgiving? I. The day appointed by the governor and commended to the observance of the colonies. I see. And the family's coming here for dinner. Well, I'll tell thee what. Go thou downstairs, help keep thy grandmother company, and I shall follow thee betimes. I obey, Father. Oh, great situation. 1656, huh? wonder if I'm dreaming. Well, even if I am, I guess I'd better get me below. 1656. Oh, it doth my heart so much good to see thee home, dear grandson. Hast thou been well? Aye, Grandmother. Ah, here is Father. Aye, Mother. Oh, Tis good to see thee, son. I am nonetheless discomfited by thy behavior. My behavior? On no day shouldst thou loll abed to so late an hour, contrary to the virtues in which I have raised thee. Why, mother, today I got up 300 years early. Eh? Oh, pay no attention. It's only a gag. Well, uh, a jest. Well, do not jest about such matters. Note thy wife, who has been up since dawn, how diligently she goeth about her domestic duties. Yes, I've been watching her work that old cooking fireplace. So that's how they... Can I give thee some help, Terry? <gasps> Canst thou give me some help? Why, Father... Son, what hast thou said? Oh, I just offered to help with some of the work. Turning that haunch of venison on that hot spit can't be too easy. Then thou art now the master in thine own house. Aye, Father, that is what thou art. Thou wouldst insult me by asking if I need help. I, who am known as an able-bodied woman whose wits are not exactly addled. All right, all right. Again, I was just kidding. I mean, I made another jest. Well, do not jest so freely. People may hear thee. Here, dear husband, sit thee down beside thy mother and thy son, and take thine ease as befits thy station. Okay. That's fine with me, <laughs> sir. Say, where's our daughter Wendy? She playeth without. Without? Oh, oh you mean outdoors, huh? Thou, Brad, how art thou doing at Yale this year? I've addressed myself with diligence to my studies and am becoming proficient in grammar, numbers, philosophy, and deportment. That's fine, that's fine. How is thy science coming? Science, too, I gain proficiency. I've learned, for example, that the tomato may be eaten. That the tomato may be eaten? What's so surprising about that? What is so surprising about that? Oh, Stan, everyone knows that the tomato is poisonous. Do you watch. Over the years, somebody will come to eat tomato, uh, tomatoes. Well, I am sure that I will never be able to touch one. Methinks heresy may be creeping in at Yale. Tomatoes, indeed. Mother! Mother! What is it, Wendy? My dear Aunt Marsha, her husband, Lou Archer, and Cousin Ralphie have arrived. Well, 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 happy well, day. Happy day. Happy day. I, I bring thee a present, brother-in-law. Well, what dost thou know? A goose. As we came hither on the trail, Lou downed the bird with one shot from his trusty blunderbuss. Thank thee, Lou. Want to take charge of this bird, Terry? Oh, just what thou needs today, a goose. I shall hang him with the other game. May I take Cousin Ralphie out to play? I may Wendy and I go out to play until dinner. And what must ye remember as ye play, children? We, we must, must remember, remember to conduct ourselves with proper sobriety, courtesy, gravity, forbearance, and trust. Also, thou must not throw any rocks, Ralphie. I never throw any rocks. It's thou who throwest rocks. I do not throw no, rocks. No, children, children. Guard thy speech against pugnacity, hostility, and contumely. And no rocks. Come, Wendy. Aye, let us go now. Ah, me. Childhood is such a sweet, innocent, carefree time. Much to be remembered. Mm, the odors from that cooking are fair appetizing. Aye, already I'm very hungry. Ask you about the tomato, Stan. The uh, tomato? Oh, Lou, at Yale, Brad learned that tomatoes are really good to eat. If thou really want us to know what is being taught at Yale, dear grandmother, they now say there are no witches. <gasps> 
No witches. Uh, Brad, thou art not serious. I speak with the utmost seriousness. This is the teaching at Yale. And from no other than the Reverend Mr. Tuttle himself. Oh, this settles it. Stan, thou must remove this boy from such influences. Oh, calm thyself, Mother. Oh, calm myself. Calm myself. Mother, what is, oh, what is causing you so much excitement? Oh, Brad has now upset Mother thoroughly by telling her that... Of course there are no witches, Mother. A guard Stan. by tongue. Stan. All we need is for this to be heard, Stan. Forgive my speaking thus, Mother, but I agree with Stan. Thou agree? Terry, have a care. Look, Mother, Brad told you that this Reverend Mr. Tuttle teaches this. Now, if this is taught at Yale... Mr. Tuttle is himself bewitched. I know there are witches. Thou knowest? How dost thou know, Mother? Do not be too curious as to how I know, but I know. Prove it. Oh, Stan, now please. Thou makest a statement? Prove it. Very well. Stand away from yon door. <gasps> Holy cow. Mother flew out the door. Look, she took the broom. The broom? Money, money. What is it, Ralphie? Wendy and I were playing without, and Grandmother went over our heads flying on a broom. Really, Stan. Well, thou shouldst have thy head examined, brother-in-law. Why jump on me? I wasn't the one who first said there are no witches. But didst thou have to make Mother prove there are? Well, now at last we know all about Mother, don't we? I. And this had best be kept a secret from the colony. She's I. coming back. And so she is. Clear the runway. Let's hope she doesn't make a crash landing. <laughs> Here is thy broom, Terry. Now see thou, Stan, Mother is always right. That was the dress rehearsal of an episode of the daytime serial called The Second Mrs. Burton, which you heard being composed by the author Hector Chevigny earlier in his home at 34 Gramercy Park. Later, it'll be polished, timed, and retyped and broadcast over the CBS radio network on Thanksgiving Day, Thursday, November 22nd. One day's episode in the five days a week program dealing with the Burton family. And now, let's go back to the author and his secretary as they talk to each other at the day's end. Yes, I think it was a good day, too, Hector. Yeah, 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 I think it was a very good day. Well, okay, kid, I'm sorry I kept you a little late tonight. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Oh, that's all right, Hector. Hmm. What are you going to do for tomorrow? What am I going to do for tomorrow? Tomorrow's scripts. Any ideas? My dear Mrs. Long, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I shall see thee <laughs> tomorrow morning. <laughs> You've been listening to the CBS Radio Workshop and a writer at work. The writer was Hector Chevigny, and those appearing in his cast of characters were Jan Miner as herself and as Terry, Ethel Owens as Mother Burton, Dwight Weist as Stan, Alice Frost as Marcia, and Larry Haynes as Lou. Others included Larry Robinson, Lynn Loring, Sarah Fussell, and Mr. Chevigny's secretary, Eleanor Lone. Writer at Work was produced by Paul Roberts and directed by Stan Davis, with music composed by Ben Ludlow and conducted by Alfredo Antonini, with Chet Kingsbury at the organ. This is Bob Height inviting you to listen again next week when, from Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop will present an original story ballad by Edmund Brophy, The Legend of Annie Christmas. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network.